surrender to that love, they could experience salvation. Amen. The cross of Calvary, what a place of love. It was a place of torment for Christ, but he was willing to suffer that for you and me. Only way to be saved is to trust what Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross. Well, thank you for that. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 21. Revelation chapter number 21. And again, welcome to everybody who came tonight. Welcome to those who are watching live stream. It's, uh, wasn't, weren't those uh, statistics amazing that people uh, would be watching and listening uh, to our messages from right here at Liberty Baptist Church just by means of a simple little computer set up all around the world and uh, hundreds and hundreds of times that uh, that's kind of like sending a missionary around the world to uh, tell people about the gospel of Christ and we get to do it from right here now we're not going to quit sending mission missionaries we're still going to do that but every way every way that we can reach somebody with the blessed gospel it's worth the effort that we go to. And I want to say thanks to Brother Aaron for going to the trouble that he does. Uh, lots of hours each week goes into that. And uh, thankfully, we're hearing feedback from people who are hearing the messages. Revelation chapter number 21. I am not preaching what I meant to preach tonight. The next, the next message should have been the great white throne judgment. It's the next thing in line the, the, we preached on the kingdom last Sunday night had a wonderful time I just thought we had a great service uh, I enjoyed preaching and I, I think everybody just enjoyed being here we spoke for a good while on the, the millennial kingdom and uh, at the end of that kingdom there, you remember the devil is loosed from his prison for a short period of time and there will be a final rebellion during that short period of time and uh, there's going to be people, even though they have been here in Christ's presence, seeing him face to face during the millennial kingdom, there will still be some folks who would not submit, who would not accept his salvation, and will be cast into hell. And uh, right after that, after the millennial reign of Christ is over, the next big event is the great white throne judgment. And friend, it's just, a, it is an awful and terrible, heartbreaking thing to think about. That all of the people, now listen to me, all of the people for all of the ages, ever since God created man, all of the people who never accepted Christ as Savior will stand at that great white throne in that day and they will each one be judged and not one excuse will be taken. They will all be faced with their deeds at the white throne judgment and they will be cast into the lake of fire as eternal punishment forever and ever and ever. No escape. Ever. And I had intended to preach that tonight, but I'm not going to preach it. I just don't think the time's right. I don't know why. I just don't know why. I just, I just believe God wanted me to move on and we're not going to skip it. We're going to come back to it. I don't know if I'll preach it next Sunday morning or next Sunday night, but I just didn't have peace about preaching it tonight. So I'm going to preach instead on heaven, chapter 21. Chapter 21. And as you turn there, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And this is a happy theme. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention the white throne judgment. Can I, can I challenge you to do something before I leave that thought? The great white throne, throne judgment, part of the reason, I think, is I couldn't get peace about preaching it tonight is because I think what we ought to do, because of the seriousness, it is not a message to be preached for pleasure, for fun. Uh, it's not a message to be preached for enjoyment. God takes no pleasure in casting lost souls into hell, and neither should we. And it is a kind of a final warning before we leave this Prophecy Now series. And so what I'd like for each of you, each of you to do is next Sunday, I, I, I'm, if the Lord will let me, I'll preach it on Sunday morning. And I'd like for each of you to bring somebody that you think probably needs to get saved. I'm not asking you to sit in judgment on them. I'm just saying, think of somebody that you think is probably not saved 
and just ask them if they'll come. Say, there's going to be a message. I can't tell you what it's all about. I haven't heard it. But it is an awesome subject, and I want you to come with me this Sunday and hear about this message that's going to be preached. And if you'll bring people, it might be that God would touch some hearts and break some hearts and save some souls. Would you do that? Will you just at least pray about it, bringing somebody? Each of us is called to be a witness for Christ. And each of us could invite somebody. Now, we can ignore, th we can ignore it and say, I don't want to do it. I'm afraid somebody might be offended. Well, do you think they might be offended on the day that, of that white throne judgment and if they're cast into hell and you had the opportunity to bring them to hear the gospel and you didn't? Do you think they might be offended about that? If they get offended about this, maybe they'll make a, make a change, accept Christ, and come to him for salvation, and then they won't have to be offended on that day being cast into the lake of fire. So think about that. Pray about it. See if there's some people. Some of you might want to make up a little list. You might want to invite five or ten different people to come. And let's, let's work on that. Let's do this as a missionary project this Sunday. All right? Now for the happy subject. Chapter 21. And what I'd like to do is read just a, a verse or two, maybe, to get started with. <clears throat> and then I'm going <clears> to <throat> bring this message a little bit differently than what we usually would. And uh, we'll go kind of verse by verse and uh, point out some, uh, some details about it as we go. But there's an application I want you to make. Are you with me? Everybody listening? We're going to be talking about the subject tonight. We're going to be talking about heaven. And uh, here's the application I want you to make. We know there's a heaven. There's a real place called heaven, and Christians are going there one day. But I believe God would have each of us to do our very best to make our church and our home and uh, the, the world that we live in make it as close to being like heaven as we can right here while we're here. So I'm going to ask you to make that application as we go through. Let's read verse number 1. Chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Father, I pray that you'd bless this hour that we have to spend in your presence. And Lord, I pray that this time would be in your presence. I pray that you would sweep over this auditorium. And Lord, that you would quiet each heart. I pray that the person who is closest to hell would listen to the message about heaven. And I pray that the one who is most concerned about their own salvation, that they would hear the love of Christ tonight. I pray that the one who is least interested and wishes they were somewhere else, I pray that you'd touch their heart and grip their heart. And Lord, that you'd let them know that you love them and that you have a way to make their life both happy here and joyful forevermore. I pray that you'd bless us in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I like a, a song I heard one time. Uh, I think the title of it is, I've Never Been This Homesick Before. I've never been this homesick before. And uh, all of God's children, people who love the Lord and know the Bible, know a little bit about heaven, as we get a little older, I think the more we begin to think about heaven and uh, we get a little bit of home, we get a little bit of homesickness and we get to want, uh, wanting to be there. And uh, like the little boy that went off to summer camp and, and uh, he, uh, he called home and uh, he had a little bit of sadness in his voice, and the, uh, the mother asked her son, she said, Son, are you homesick? He said, No, I'm here sick. <laughs> and and uh, he wanted to go home. <laughs> and uh, I think many of us who are saved tonight and know the reality of heaven could probably say, I'm a little bit here sick, and I would like to be there. And uh, one of these days, one of these days, we'll get to be there. But what's it like? I want you to watch in the, the Bible this evening, in chapter 21, as we go through this, and be thinking about what the Apostle John saw. The Apostle John wrote the book of of Revelation, 
The Apostle John was one of those guys we, we studied about uh, last week or last Wednesday night, one of the apostles. He was one of the sons of thunder. There was a time when he was one of those brothers that wanted to call fire down from heaven and consume those Samaritans that weren't very friendly to Jesus. And now the Apostle John has had a glimpse of heaven. He's been anointed by the Holy Spirit, caught up into heaven, and he has seen uh, heaven with spiritual eyes. And, and the Spirit of God now has given him privilege to write this book of Revelation. And in this passage, passage he writes about heaven. It's just as real. What John saw and what John wrote about is just as real as if you were to see a documentary filmed in heaven tonight and shown on the screen right here in our auditorium. It would be more real because the Word of God is the infallible, inerrant, inspired, preserved Word of God. And if we had a video of heaven, we wouldn't know for sure that it was real. But this Word of God is real, amen? <laughs> and it's true. Well, I want you to see some things about this passage. Now, you can just jot them down. We won't spend a lot of time on each one, but we want to give you a scan of the whole picture that God gives of the Bible here. I was, uh, I was privileged to go to, uh, to the... Uh, uh, what, Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park up in Wyoming one summer back years ago. We went in one August and took a couple of families, went together, and, and we drove through the Yellowstone National Park and saw Old, Faith, Old Faithful, and the geyser, and we saw the, the falls and the Yellowstone River, and we saw the, the, the hot springs boiling and bubbling, saw one pool that, that was called the Devil's Pool and where it just stunk. I mean, it smelled like awful boiled eggs, sulfur, rotten eggs, just boiling up muddy looking water it just boils all the time smells like it probably came from hell and it may, maybe it does I don't know but uh, but we looked at all of the beautiful sights and strange sights around the Yellowstone and and we drove through the Badlands uh, and, and the Badlands of uh, South Dakota and uh, the uh, uh, Black Hills where the president's heads are and, uh, and and it was just magnificent to see all those things we just did our own guided tour and saw all those beautiful things. Well, I want you to know that that's not near as beautiful as what heaven is, and heaven is a much greater place. Let's look at this now. And uh, I want you to give you number one. The first thing about heaven we want to see tonight is that it's a permanent place. It's a permanent place. He says uh, in that first verse again, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Hey, what happened to the first earth and the first heaven? They were passed away. Let me tell you, friend, that where we live tonight, this old earth, the Bible says, is going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to boil and bubble, and the very elements of our earth are going to melt. That's what the scriptures say. Going to melt with fervent heat. And then it says, seeing that these things shall come to pass, what manner of men ought we to be? And so it gives us time to think that this place where we live is temporary. It's a temporary home. How many of you heard in the news this past week about the fellow down in Florida who was sleeping in his bed Thursday night and the earth opened up and he dropped into the sinkhole under his house? Did you hear that on the news? Isn't that an amazing thing? Scary, isn't it? This man was laying in his bed sleeping. I mean, where... Is anybody safe if you can't sleep in your bed? And he fell into a sinkhole and disappeared. His brother tried to go down in and, and find him and pull him out, but they finally pulled him out and told him it was un, too unsafe to even try to look for his own brother. And so he's down under all that rubble, and they say that hole is probably 100 feet deep, maybe or more, underneath that house. And maybe some other houses might possibly fall into that sinkhole also. I'll guarantee you one thing, I wouldn't be sleeping on that block tonight. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you'd think your house sitting on a concrete foundation would be a fairly safe place to be, but it's a temporary place where we live, ladies and gentlemen. It's a temporary place. And uh, God's going to bring a permanent place one of these days. And heaven, heaven will be a place that will never go away. It's going to be there from now on. The Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Dwight L. Moody, the old evangelist from back in the 1800s, had something that he said, and I like what he said about heaven. He uh, talking about uh, Abraham that looked for a 
city whose builder and maker was God. And uh, here's what he said. Dwight, Dwight L. Moody said, My heaven is a solid heaven. After the resurrection has come, you will have a resurrection foot and something to walk on. You will have a resurrection eye and colors and substances to see with. You'll have a resurrection ear and voices and music to read gaily. You'll have a resurrection heart and love to satisfy it. And then he said this. He said, I have no patience with your transcendental, gelatinous, gaseous heaven. Heaven is a permanent place, dear friend. And I like what D.L. Moody said about that heaven. We're going to have the body to experience it with a solid foot on a solid walkway. And that's something to be excited about. Now, I said I wanted to make some application to the home and to the church and to our lives as we go through this. Can I just say to you that our, our homes ought to be a relatively permanent place. It can't be as permanent as heaven, but our homes, ladies and gentlemen, the place where we live, our homes need to be a place where the boys and girls that live there feel secure. It needs to be a solid place. It doesn't need to be a place where they wake up in the morning and wonder if mommy's going to leave that day or daddy's going to walk out of their life and never come back. You hear what I'm saying? We need to have our homes to be a permanent place, a place where kids feel secure and where mom feels secure with dad's provision and dad feels secure with mom's love. And that's the kind of home we need, a permanent home. Wouldn't you agree with that? Say amen. Number two, it needs to be a prepared place. Heaven is a prepared place. Look in verse two. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, get this. Here's the picture. John is standing there and he says, Wow, at this particular time, after the kingdom, Going into the eternal state. That's why we'll call this the eternal state, heaven. But I thought heaven was way up yonder somewhere. It is, but it's coming down here. When God creates a new heaven and a new earth, somehow lowered from the, the heaven is going to be the new Jerusalem. And it's going to drift right down like you had a big old crane hooked to it and a cable on the end of it. And it's going to drop the new Jerusalem down right over the earth. I, from what I can picture in my mind, it seems as though, and from the Bible preachers of the past, it seems as though this new Jerusalem is going to hover over the earth and, uh, and there will be a, an ability to go back and forth from the earth to the city. You say, well, one little city is not going to be big enough to handle all the people. Wait till you read the description of it. <laughs> this New Jerusalem is quite a city, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, and 1,500 miles high. I'd say there'd probably be enough room there, wouldn't you? I think it'll house all of us. But look what it says here. I'm going to focus on this part, talking about the New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. <laughs> I performed a few weddings. I, I performed one on a, on a river dock out in Denver, Colorado or up in the mountains and uh, Everglades, or not the Everglades, what was it? Uh, Evergreen, Evergreen, Colorado. That's where they had the famous barbecue place, Dick's Hickory Dock. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> uh, well, it really was there. And uh, I did a wedding up there one time and uh, this couple was getting married and everything in the world that could go wrong went wrong and, and we're on a, on a dock that's sticking out over the water and they've got me backed up right to the edge of the dock. The water's running right there and they're standing here. My heels are hanging over the edge of the dock and I almost stepped off into the river once while I was performing the ceremony. Had the bride walking down through there crossing mud puddles with a, with a bridal dress on doing hopscotch to try to keep her dress out of the out of the the mud puddles as she came down. Uh, some of the people didn't show up on time. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of unique and kind of uh, pretty in its own way. A, a, a bride dressed in her bridal gown out there in the middle of the Rocky Mountains on the edge of her fast-flowing riverbank. I've done uh, 
I've done weddings in, uh, in church buildings and uh, outside in yards, and we, we always think the bride is pretty. Isn't that right? Now everybody, at that moment when you're standing here, and, uh, and I remember when my son Aaron and our daughter-in-law Erica got married here, and, and everybody's uh, glancing around, and you know you look at the groom, and you look at the groomsman, and, and you watch the bridal maids come in, and uh, you're watching everything going on. But, but that most exciting moment is when? When the doors open and the bridal march starts and that bride steps through the door in her pretty white gown she starts down the aisle and every eye's on the bride. Everybody's looking. Nobody's ever seen an ugly bride. They're all pretty, right? I mean, they, they, they primp and fix up for three weeks. They've got to be pretty. And uh, now, <clears throat> now, Some of them just barely made it, but they were pretty, you know. <laughs> And uh, the Bible says that it's like, that heaven's like a, a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem comes floating down, and it says she's adorned, adorned. You know all the pretty things a bride puts on? What about that city of God? Do you suppose God would have some shoddy thing coming down out of heaven? Do you think he's just tacked together? Jesus said in John chapter 14, I go and prepare a place for you. <laughs> I go and prepare a place for you. Do you suppose that he might be doing things right? That he might be making that place to look beautiful? I mean, if he's spending all this time preparing that city to come down, I think we're going to like it, friend. I think it's going to be pretty. And just like we watch the doors for the bride to come through at a wedding, oh, I think when we see the Lord Jesus bringing the New Jerusalem down out of heaven. Oh, I think our eyes are going to be glued on it. And when it says it's adorned, I don't think we've seen anything yet. <laughs> it's going to be pretty. It's going to be prepared. Now, can I make that application to our homes? Our homes ought to be prepared. What do I mean? Well, if Jesus goes to all that trouble to make heaven nice for us, what should we do to make our homes nice? Oh, I'm not talking about just making them pretty. Some people don't have the money to make them real pretty, but you can make them clean. Some people don't have the, the money to build a, a half a million dollar house, but it can be prepared where it's adequate and where it's comfortable and where people like to be there. Let me ask you something, ladies. Does your husband like to come home? Or does he look for some place else to go? It ought to be the kind of place, a prepared place where he wants to come home. He wants to come home. Oh, and fellas, listen, how do we, how do we make home when we're there? I mean, if things are falling apart, do we either fix it or get somebody to fix it, or do we just leave it alone? They are, homes ought to be a prepared place. Dads ought to study how to be dads. I mean, we learn how to be, we learn how to be carpenters and plumbers and mechanics and truck drivers and doctors and lawyers and politicians. I wonder how much we ought to study to be a good husband and a good dad. Buy yourself a book, or better yet, read the book. <laughs> Learn how to be a good husband. I'm planning on doing a lot of preaching in the near future on the family. I tell you, friends, it looks obvious to me that the devil is attacking the family harder than he's attacking anything else today, unless it's the... The, the governmental institutions, but it has to start with the family. If he can destroy the family, then he can get control of the government too. And we need to make our homes fireproof, foolproof, devilproof. Make them the kind of place where our family loves to be, a prepared place. Number three, heaven will be a praising place. Look at verse three. A praising place. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall wipe away, or shall be with them and be their God. Let's stop there for now. This is the kind of place where God is going to be. God's going to be with us. God's going to be with us. He's going to tabernacle with us. He's going to live with us. Hey, listen, the great thing about being in heaven, being in New Jerusalem and being on the new heavens and the new earth is going to be that God's going to come here and be with us. Now, I understand that he's omnipresent right now. Did you know there's no place you can go away from God? Wherever you go, he's already there. <laughs> Why is that? Because he's omnipresent. Did you ever stop to think about this? God doesn't have to go anywhere. <laughs> he's already there. 
<laughs> Isn't that great? God never goes anywhere. He's already there. He's in eternity. He's in eternity past. He's in eternity future. And he's here right now. But you know what? In the day that we get to live in heaven, we're going to live in the, in the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and we're going to walk with him side by side. <laughs> and we're going to be with him. We're going to get to talk to him. It's going to go back like it was kind of in the Garden of Eden. Remember when God created Adam and Eve? And uh, God came looking for Adam and, the, and Eve in the cool of the day because he'd been walking with them. It was their habit to walk together in the cool of the day. And... Uh, God couldn't find Adam because Adam had sinned and they were hiding. Well, there won't be any sin in heaven, but we'll be walking with God. Like Adam, the fellowship had, God had with Adam in the beginning. What about that? Wouldn't that be something, just be walking along with Jesus? You say, well, how in the world would there be time for everybody to take turns walking with Jesus? Well, now listen, it's not like we're going to be in any hurry. I mean, you ain't got no place to go. And if you did have, you ain't got no time to be back. And if you did have a time to be back, you got plenty of time to go again. And I mean, it's not like we're going to run out of days or weeks or months or years. Because when we get to heaven, friend, it's going to last forever. <laughs> we don't have to worry. No alarm clocks. Can I get an amen? <laughs> no daylight savings plan or time, whatever they call that. <laughs> it's going to be a a praising place. We get to be with God and we get to praise the Lord. And uh, that's, that's going to be a great time. You know what? We need to make our homes a little bit of a praising place, don't you think? When, uh, when we come to church, what's wrong with just kind of getting a smile on her face and say, you know, I kind of like to be here. I kind of I kind of like to be around my brothers and sisters in Christ. I kind of like it when they sing and, and it touches my heart and they tell me about Jesus and his wonderful love and how I was a dirty, rotten sinner and he loved me anyway and saved me anyway. Hey, how about just shouting out once in a while and say, Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't that be all right? Uh, you better get used to it. They're going to do it in heaven. That just goes to show you probably won't be very many Baptists there. <laughs> huh? We may as well go ahead and practice on it a little bit. Get your hallelujahs in order. Get your praise the Lord's in order. Uh, your arm won't break if you were to lift it up. <laughs> oh, we might even wave our hankies a little bit, huh? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a praising place, ladies and gentlemen. I think maybe the ladies here on earth, the Bible says ladies are supposed to have a quiet and meek spirit. Now, I don't know, but up there, the Lord may allow you to wave your hanky. I don't know. But ladies, you can just get your hanky out every once in a while. And if you want to be, have a quiet and meek spirit, you can sit there and not, never say a word, but you can do this. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, we ought to have a good time praising place. Uh, our churches ought to be praising places. It ought not be like a funeral. There's enough funerals as it is without turning our church house into a funeral home. Amen? <laughs> just threw my watch away. Don't forget to let me know when midnight comes. It ought to be a praising place. We ought to just praise the Lord. I mean, look, if we can't praise the Lord, where can you do it? But let me take it a step further. Our home. Now, many people come to church and cut up a little bit, and they'll laugh a little bit. They even get, they even get loosened up enough that they'll just laugh at some of the preacher's old corny jokes every once in a while. But you know what? It's good for you to laugh at home. Hello? We need to go home and have a good time. Learn to laugh with your wife, men. Sometimes we go home and we're so stiff and straight-laced. Man, we go in there and sit and look like, look like our face is made out of brass. <laughs> it's okay to smile at home. <laughs> it's okay just to tell a joke every once in a while. I told my, I told my wife that joke that I told here last week about the men <laughs> that uh, talked about the snow getting so deep outside and his wife was just staring through the kitchen window and... and uh, the snow kept getting deeper and deeper and the wind getting harder and harder and he said he said my wife's just stared through the kitchen window all day and he said if, the, if it gets any worse I'm going to let her inside and and I told my wife that and she laughed I was afraid she might hit me but she thought it's funny <laughs> we need to laugh a little bit just do things for fun I mean hide behind the door and jump out and scare her sometimes 
Did I tell you about Curtis Hudson, the evangelist that time that, that came home from a preaching engagement and he got home about midnight and his wife had already gone to bed and gone to sleep and he went around and set all the clocks. It was midnight and he set all the clocks for five o'clock <laughs> and, uh, and then set the alarm. And so he took his clothes off and got in bed real quiet and easy. He was in bed about 10 minutes and those alarm clocks started going off. And his wife got up and he said, honey, the alarm clock's going off. She said, I know, I'm trying to, and she shut it off. She said, boy, I feel like I just went to bed. <laughs> And he said, I know I'm tired too, but he said, we got to get up. It's time to get up. He got her get up and fix breakfast, and he ate the breakfast before he ever told her what he'd done. <laughs> I think she thought it was funny a day or two later. <laughs> you remember how fun it was back when you were first courting your spouse and you just couldn't wait to be with them and you're with them all the time and want to spend that time and just had to be around them and, and it, you aren't, weren't just as happy as you could be unless you were around them, you know. And, uh, well, what happened? <laughs> huh? Yeah, like the, the old man and old woman's driving down the road in the pickup truck and he's sitting over there driving down the road. They're about 75 and she's sitting over against the door and they met another car coming and looked over and said, as she said, honey, look at those, that couple there sitting so close together. What happened to us? He said, well, I ain't moved. You know, we need to get the zeal back. We need to get the fire back. Try holding her hand, brother. <laughs> Hold her hand. Tell her she's pretty. Get excited about your marriage again. Have a laughing time at home. It ought to be a praising place. Let me tell you something. How to, let me tell you how to rekindle the fires again. Now listen to me. I'm telling you, our families are dying down and too many people are deciding, to this, hey, this, this marriage is not as much fun as it used to be. I'm out of here, Jack. Wrong way. God meant for you to get married, stay married, go to heaven together. Amen. <laughs> Just stay married. Let me tell you how to get a good start on putting it back together again. Here's what you might try. Quit being so stinking selfish and pay your mate some compliments. Learn how to say please and thank you again. Huh? <laughs> if she brings you a nice dessert and sets it down on the table, <laughs> maybe you ought to consider saying, well, thanks, sweetheart. <laughs> that might help things get fired up again. And uh, do th some little things for each other. Have you tried maybe writing some notes? You remember like you did when you were younger? <laughs> Try leaving some little notes of, of gratitude. Gratitude will change your attitude. And if you change your attitude, it'll change your altitude, and you'll get flying a little bit higher. We need to put some spice back in our homes again. Hey, let's try that with our kids. Kids ought to be trying to be a little bit complimentary and thankful for their parents. Did you know if it weren't for your parents, young people, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have a place. Try living in a foster home. Probably wouldn't be quite as nice as having a real home with a mom and dad there. We ought to show some gratitude. Do you know, do you know that the world, listen, I'm going to shock you. You don't even have to learn this in science class, but young people, the world does not rotate around you. The universe does not rotate around you. You are not the center of the universe. Now, you can go out here tonight for sure knowing something that you didn't know before. <laughs> There's one God, and you're not it. Start being nice to your parents, kids. Number four, heaven's a peaceful place. Woo, I like that, don't you? <laughs> I mean, we got, we got nation rising against nation and wars and rumors of wars. It won't ever be peaceful on earth until Jesus comes back. It's just not going to happen, friend. Now, they can do some things maybe to curb some of, the, some of the tension in the world, but they're not going to stop the wars. It's going to happen. It's prophesied. It's going to happen. But we can have peace in our church. We can have peace in our families. You can have peace at your job. And there's going to be peace in heaven. Look at verse 4. And God shall wipe away all their tears, all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Can you say amen right there? Neither sorrow nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain. Well, glory be to God. Those who have arthritis are going to be glad about that, aren't you? No more pain. Those who have hives are not going to be in pain anymore. Those who have to wear glasses, we can toss them away. <laughs> and uh, if you've got a walking stick, you won't need it up there. And uh, it's going to be a very peaceful place. Now, I've said uh, something about weddings a little while ago. I've, I've done some funerals, too. And uh, I can tell you about some of the funerals. Some of them have been very strange. But I just remember walking away from most of them, sometimes with an arm around somebody's shoulder and comforting somebody who's crying and somebody who's weeping. We've buried a couple of Miss Charlotte's sons. And we've... Uh, We've buried Miss Crockett's uh, dad, and, and uh, the places have buried a couple of parents here, and, and several of the rest of you have, have buried some people, and, and it's always a heartache. Somebody's heart is aching, and uh, we just wonder sometimes, why does God let us go through these things? Well, let me tell you, first of all, that people die. Some people get mad at God because they had a loved one to die. Now listen to me. Listen to me carefully. You don't get God mad at God because somebody died. God said, it is appointed unto men once to die. So don't get mad at God. Look, I'm not saying it won't hurt, and I'm not saying it's fun. But death is real, and death happens. Everybody in this room has lost someone. And it's going to happen to some others, and eventually all of us if Jesus doesn't come back soon. And so if you get mad at God every time somebody dies, you're going to be mad all the time because people are going to keep dying. And you're going to die. I said you're going to die. You're going to die if Jesus doesn't come back soon. And so that's not God's fault. God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden not to sin. They had one commandment to keep and they blew it. And he said in the day you break that one commandment, you're going to die and you're going to pass death upon the human race. You see, it wasn't God's fault. It was man's fault. And all the, the people who whine and cry and bellyache and say, I'm not ever going to believe in God because if there was a God, he wouldn't let all the suffering and all the starving and all the children go hungry all over the world and people die and wars and there can't be a God. He wouldn't let all of that happen. He wouldn't cause all of that. He didn't cause all of that. People caused that. And this heaven is going to be a, a peaceful place. And we ask, why does God let us go through this? Why does he let us? Jesus had a Calvary. Sometimes we have some Calvaries. Not like his, but ours brings some heartache and grief. You know, one of the things, one of the reasons he lets bad things happen in our lives to make us homesick, to want to be up there. Because if we liked it too much here, we just want to stay. And he wants us to be with him. Then heaven, number five, is going to be a pleasing place, a pleasing place. Look at num verse number six and following. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, <clears throat> the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, what does that mean? That means God's going to give you what your heart yearns for. Whatever your heart longs for. When you're in heaven, you're going to have, you won't have anything that you'll yearn for that will not be met. You may have desires here on this earth, things that your heart aches for. You may not ever get it on this earth. And that's something young people need to learn too. You don't get everything you want. Most of us older folks are beginning to learn that. We used to think we'd get everything we wanted. And it doesn't happen, does it, Brother Denny? You don't get everything. I can go back in my mind and think about things in the past, and I say, boy, if I could go back and change this or to change that, but you can't. There's things that happen, and history stays in history. And the best thing you can do is leave history back there in history. Leave your history alone back there and keep pressing forward. And don't drag up other people's history and try to hurt people with it. Husbands and wives tend to do that. Are you listening to me? You don't drag up your wife's history or your husband's history and say, well, you remember back when you... That's a cheap trick. Not good. 
You don't help anybody by doing that. You keep looking forward in hope towards the future. There'll be a day coming when we get everything that we want. When we're in heaven, there won't be anything that our heart will yearn for, but that God will supply it. Isn't that great to think about? In our homes, in our homes. Let me tell you how to contribute to a happy home. If each of us, are you listening? Look in my eyeballs. As old brother uh, Ron Garris used to say, he was the head of uh, Rock of Ages Prison Ministries, <laughs> and he was just the meekest and mildest man, Brother Jerry, you'd ever see when he wasn't in the pulpit. When he got in the pulpit, man, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. You know? <laughs> he gets in the pulpit, and he, he's, just, he's just the quietest little man. You'd never think this guy is a pipsqueak. He gets in the pulpit, he's like, Look me in the God-given eyeballs, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to look in my eyeballs for a minute one thing you can do to help fix your home is to go about doing what you can do to meet the needs of others we live in a self-centered self-serving world where everybody is living in the me generation and I want what's going to make me happy and if I'm not happy, ain't nobody going to be happy. Well, that'll make a real sweet home, won't it? You'll make a hell on earth is what you'll make with that kind of attitude. What we need are some people who are like Jesus said in the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. If I go about in my home trying to find things to do to make my wife happy, guess what? The Bible teaches in Galatians chapter 6, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If I want to be treated like a king, I better learn how to treat her like a queen. Hello? You know what I do for her in the morning? I get up first. I beat my wife up every morning. No. <laughs> I get up first. And uh, I go to the kitchen, and I have my little ritual I go through. I go by and let the little puppy dogs out of their cage, and then I go over to the sink and turn on the hot water, let it be running to warm up my, my thermos carafe, and I put my coffee in. And while that water's warming up and I'm getting everything, the coffee maker ready to go, at the same time I'm mixing up a glass of my barley green. How many ever ever drunk barley green? Anybody? Aaron has. Barley green is a powder. It's, it's got the consistency of flour. No smart aleck remarks, please. Uh, it's, a green, it's, it's a green powder, the consistency of flour, and you mix it up. It's, it's a powdered barley green juice. It's made out of green barley leaves, not made out of the barley grain, but it's barley green made out of the leaves. It has all the chlorophyll and all the enzymes and all that good stuff that makes you handsome and big and strong like me. And, uh, and I mix up a jar of that, about eight ounces, and I mix up half, half for me and half for my wife. I drink half of it, take the other half to her, and I finish making the coffee, or the coffee's making by that time. I grind fresh coffee beans. See, I know how to make a woman happy. <laughs> she says my coffee's the best coffee in the world. And so... I mix it up just right, grind up fresh coffee beans every morning, make a pot of coffee, and I'll doctor it up. She drinks uh, half and half in hers. I drink mine like a man. And uh, <laughs> mine's got whiskers. Mine's got whiskers in it. <laughs> and uh, I mix up that. I, I, after I've taken her barley green, then I take her that cup of coffee and give it to her while she's still in bed. And then I say, now leave me alone, woman, while I read my Bible. <laughs> no, I don't say it like that. That's what I mean. <laughs> and so then I go back she thanks me for it she'll say something like oh I love my honey and I love my house and I love my life see I'm getting a good start for the day already right now that'll, that'll, help, your, that'll help the peace in the home that'll help, the, uh, that'll help to keep the turmoil down you learn to do something for your spouse see and it, and it might help your romance a little bit too you know what I'm saying and so uh, if you want to have a peaceful home, look and see what you can do for the other person instead of looking to see what somebody can do for me. 
If I'll be busy doing something for somebody else, it usually comes back. The Bible says in Proverbs, if you cast your bread upon many waters, it'll come back to you. And so what you do is keep casting the bread on the waters. You want to get it back. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If your spouse treated you like you treat them, what would it be like? Hello? You say, well, she started it. Grow up. <laughs> All right. Well, get back to my outline. I did have an outline, I promise you. Well, number seven. I got to go a little faster. Number seven, heaven is a purified place. Watch this, verse number eight. Did I skip one? Did I skip one or did I get, I'm still on track? Huh? Five was a pleasing place. Well, call this number six then. <laughs> heaven is a purified place, verse number eight. I, God called me to preach. He didn't call me to count. Heaven is a purified place. Verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, don't get the idea that everybody's going to heaven. There is the universalist idea that if everybody just hangs around long enough, we'll all get to heaven. No, you... You'll go to heaven if you're saved. That's the way it works. And he says right here that those who demonstrate these particular characteristics are going to be in the lake of fire. These are not the saved people. And uh, been redeemed, you've been born again, then there's no fear for you. Now you say, well, that's a pretty bad list. I saw the, I saw the abominable there. That sounds pretty bad. And I see the the murderers there, and I'm not one of those, and the whoremongers, by the way, all the shacking up that's going on today, the Bible says whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You try shacking up, and God's going to lower the boom on you if you're a child of God. Hello? That's not popular preaching, but it's biblical preaching. If you want to live with them, marry them. You know what's, why there's so many abortions in our in our country today it's because people are busy having fun and they don't want the consequences if you don't want the consequences mister keep your britches on hello I'm serious you people watching by way of internet God loves you but he doesn't mean for his children to go around being a bunch of whoremongers well that's what the Bible says I didn't get any amens but it's still true and I'm still going to preach it Thank you, brother. <laughs> you say, but look at that, look at that list. Uh, you've got the murderers and the whoremongers and the abominable and the sorcerers. What's that? The witchcraft. And there's a lot of stuff attached to the witchcraft today. The drugs and the piercings and, the, and, and a lot of the devilish looking tattoos you see people get. What are we advertising anyway? Sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. It says these people have their late part in like uh, part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. You say, well, I'm not one of those. Did you read the first part of the verse? Just make sure that you don't fit into there. Look at that. The fearful. Whoa. The fearful guy is put in there with all of these other bad people? Yeah. If you're saved, you won't be fearful of hell. When you get saved, God takes away your fear because your guilt is gone. You know that you've been born again. And the unbelieving? What, that second one says the unbelieving. You see, the only way to heaven is to believe your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. People, people continually get the idea. It's part of growing up. I don't know why, but it seems like the way we grow up, we just grow up naturally thinking that if we do good, we go to heaven. If we do bad, we go to hell. That ain't the way it works. Everybody does bad. Everybody does bad. Everybody's born a sinner. The Bible says there's not none that doeth good. None that are righteous. No, not one. How many? No, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, if you're watching by way of the internet, I want to tell you, 
if you've never been born again, you're still lost in your sins. Now, I love you and God loves you, but he's not going to... He's not going to save you because you're good. He'll save you when you admit you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And when you ask him, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wants you to be saved, but he's waiting for you to ask. Well, the unbelieving there. And so heaven's going to be purified from sin. Nobody's going into heaven with sin. Can't get there with sin. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought you said everybody was a sinner. <laughs> yeah, but when you trust Christ as your Savior, he purges you from sin. It's like this. We're all sinners, and none of us have a righteousness of our own. If this were the blood of Christ, I'm a sinner, and I can't get to heaven with my own sins. I need some borrowed righteousness. I don't have any of my own, and neither do you. But when I put on Christ, his righteousness becomes imputed to me and your friend, friend your church can't do that for you your baptistry can't do that for you your good deeds can't do that for you the only way you can have the righteousness of Christ is admitting you're a sinner and you need the Savior who bled and died for your sins he loves you and he'll put his righteousness on you but it'll be his righteousness not yours our homes also should be purified from sinful things can I just tell you that one of the one of the worst scourges of the Christian family today is pornography. It used to be just dirty magazines, and now the Internet is so polluted with it. It's, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll pull it up accidentally. You've got to be on guard. And pornography will absolutely destroy your spirituality, and it'll destroy your life. If you let it go unchecked, you better purify your home from ungodly things. And that goes for more than just pornography. Some people dress like they're starring in pornography. I mean, it's summertime. Spring's just around the corner. As Brother Vineyard used to say, the burlesque season is coming up. It's when people start stripping down and pulling off their clothes. I wonder why it is a woman will never dream of going to the door and answering the doorbell in her underwear, but she'll dress the same way to go to a public swimming pool. A lot of amens right there. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> I mean, they go to... Women think that just because they're going swimming that that makes it okay to be naked then. The Bible says that we're not to display our nakedness. And I'm telling you, people go around today. I want a trip to Hawaii once, and I, I'd always thought I'd enjoy going there, but my wife and I had to rent a car and go to... The, to the interior of the island to get away from the beaches. I mean, it was like a pornography show on the beach. Some of those women, most of those women strutting around and, well, there wasn't enough material in their bikini to make a pair of leggings for a mosquito. I mean, it was serious, friend. And we had, we just went driving through the cane fields and looked at volcanoes and mountains and stuff. Well, we need to purge our homes from sinful things. And I think some dads need to take the lead in home, in home and tell their daughters, you're not wearing that. You're not, wearing, you're not exposing your breasts. And you're not exposing your thighs. You're not exposing your belly. You're going to put some clothes on and cover up, girl, as long as you live in my house. <laughs> hey, listen, we, we live in a day of spineless dads. Hadn't got enough guts, afraid of, afraid of his wife, afraid of his uh, teenage daughters, can't tell them. Hey, and by the way, if you let them dress like little harlots until they turn 13 or 14, it's hard to convince them then that it's wrong. Hello. Better start, better start early. Now, it's getting quiet in here. I hope you folks on the Internet are still with me. All my people left here. <laughs> number seven, heaven is a precious place. Is my, my numbering back right again? Number seven, heaven is a precious place. Verse number nine, I'm going faster. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, this is the new Jerusalem. And uh, in verse 10, you'll, <coughs> you'll see the description just let's go ahead and read verse 10 and he carried me away in the spirit 
Now, the bride in other places is talking about the church, but here it's talking about the new Jerusalem. Verse 10 says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now look at what it says. Verse 11, Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now this city is 1,500 miles cubed. 1,500 miles. That's, that's almost the distance from, well, it's like going from here to L.A. Uh, it's a pretty big city. That from here to Los Angeles, California, being one city, that'd be pretty big, wouldn't it? And then just consider taking that city and turning it up on the end and going 1,500 miles straight up. You'd say, man, that, that would take a long, tall elevator, and it would. I, I told you about getting on the elevator to the hospital a while back. I always have a ball when I do that. I uh, asked the, the people all crowded on the elevator here at the hospital in, in White County Hospital Medical Center the other night, and everybody got on the elevator, and I turned around and faced them. I said, I guess all you folks are wondering why I've called you together this way. And uh, they just looked at me, and then they started laughing. Well, I tried it down at Little Rock the day before yesterday when I went down to see the Hopkins. I tried it on the Little Rock elevator. Those folks don't have near as good a sense of humor. <laughs> Uh, I had to make an exit fast. I was afraid they was calling the people with the white suits on. <laughs> 1,500 miles high. Yeah, that's a big city. Some of the commentators say that this precious stone that's crystal clear uh, might be describing a diamond. And uh, I don't know, have you heard about the world's, I think this is still the world's largest diamond, the, the Golden Jubilee, is that right? It's 545 carats. Uh, I think the, the, the rough diamond was four inches long before they polished it. Four inches long. That's a pretty good sized diamond, wouldn't you think? My wife would like that. I may get it for her. <laughs> I'll need to raise. <laughs> you know what? It's a beautiful city. Our homes should have a beautiful character, a beautiful character. People knock on our door that instead of hearing yelling and screaming and cussing inside, they should see somebody with a pleasant face and pleasant home life where the kids enjoy being there and the whole family's having a good time. Next point, whatever we're on now, I guess this is eight. It is a, heaven is a protected place. Verses 12 uh, through 14. And had a great wall and high and twelve <clears throat> and had twelve gates and the gates at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the north, or on the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and, uh, and let me stop there for now but he just he's just talking about a high walled city 250 feet high I believe is the way that calculates out that's pretty high wall wouldn't you say pretty high wall around it and uh, a wonderful wonderful place number nine heaven is a perfect place look at verse 15 and he he that talked with me had a golden reed a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are what? Equal. A perfect cube, a perfect city, a perfect place. Now that might be hard to apply to our homes, we won't have a perfect home. We'll have a perfect heaven. We won't have a perfect home, but you know what that tells me? We need a little bit of uh, grace in our homes because we need to realize we can't expect perfection out of our homes. We better love what we've got and appreciate what we've got and not demand perfection out of your mate, out of your children, or out of your parents. It doesn't exist. We're flawed people, and we married flawed people, and we had flawed kids.
And when you get to heaven, everything will be straightened down. It's a perfect place. Here's just a couple of things that won't be in heaven. Verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. What does that mean? <laughs> well, the temple is a place where you meet God. You go to meet God in the temple. And we're going to get to meet God in heaven, be with him all the time. And uh, his Shekinah glory is going to be there. And uh, there's not going to be a, a sanctuary there, no sun there. Verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. There be no sinners there. Verse 24, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Only saved people will be in heaven. If you're not saved, you're not going. I said, if you're not saved, you're not going. If you're not saved, you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. Now, I know it's a happy, we're talking about a happy place and a happy time, but I've got to tell you, you don't get to enjoy the happy place if you're not saved. You've got to be saved. You've got to be saved. It's not something you do. It's something you're given as a gift. Salvation is from the Lord. Well, I had a letter I wanted to read just a little too long. Um, I'll skip over the letter. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. I wonder if you're prepared tonight. I wonder if you that are watching by way of the internet or recording. I wonder if you're prepared to go to heaven. You're not prepared if you're in your sins yet. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. He loves you. He died for you. He shed his blood on Calvary's cross, and he will save you in a heartbeat. Friend, he wants you to be saved more than your mother does, more than your daddy does. God wants you to be saved. And he'll save you when you trust him for sure. There's no magic in the words. But if you believe Jesus died for you and rose again for you, that's the gospel. And if you'll believe it and call on him, he'll save you. You have to be able to recognize what the gospel is. It's not working for your salvation. It's believing. Even Abraham believed, the Bible said. He believed and is counted unto him for righteousness. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Have you believed on Christ as your Savior? If not, heaven won't be for you. It'll be for your friends who are saved. It'll be for your family who's saved. It'll be for church members who are saved. But it won't be for you. Would you trust him tonight? I hope you will. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray tonight that you'd bless every person under the sound of my voice. Lord, I'm not a, an eloquent preacher, but I know what the gospel is. And I can't say it as nicely as some preachers can, but, Lord, I can tell them that Jesus bled on Calvary's cross to pay for their every sin. And, Lord, if they will trust you, I know you'll save them. You've already said you would. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to know that you love them. Help them to know you're not a big, mean, bully God just walking around in heaven waiting to club somebody and cast them into hell. Help them to know that you've done everything possible to make a way into heaven for them. Lord, help them to know that if they refuse your offer of salvation, that they'll have to crawl over the blood of Christ to get into hell. Lord, I pray that you'd help them know that you love them enough you'd save them right now, that they don't have to wait, that you'd save them tonight. Lord, for those of us who are saved, and Lord, maybe we've been unhappy with our present state of life. Maybe we've been unhappy with our home, our husbands, wives, children, parents. Lord, I pray that you'd convict our hearts tonight. And Lord, help us to know that you want some stability in our lives. You want us to do what's right and not be flitting around all over the place looking for something new, but to make our homes that we have right now the happiest place this side of heaven. I pray that you'd bless our folks tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.